Guys, so uh, today's recitation is going to be on generative adversarial networks and uh, we hope to cover some ground in this recitation about um, how to train a GAN, some of, some of the different variants of the GAN um, and like we know GANs are hard to train so we're going to try and see some optimization techniques, some evaluation metrics. Um, so this recitation is mostly aimed for those of you who are interested in working with GANs and especially for those of you who are working with GANs for your course project. So if you have any questions uh, in terms of like uh, how to train a GAN or something that you haven't understood as we progress, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, so let's begin. Um, so essentially there have been, GANs have been like a very hot topic over the past for quite some time now and there has, there has been some very, very cool applications with GANs. So um, for example, there is text to image generation, there are some very high resolution images that are being generated that are almost, I mean, it's very hard to find the difference bet between what's real and what's generated anymore. So um, I'm just going to first do a quick refresher on what GANs are and the, the loss function and then we will move on to looking into some code on how to train GANs. So um, first and foremost, like what does a GAN do? So think of only this part of the diagram here. So you have an input and you want to generate an image. Now the image has to be extremely close to the true distribution of the data that you have. And your input is just going to be a noise. So from a noise, you're trying to generate an image that is extremely close to a true distribution. Now a generator cannot do this on its own. So that brings in the discriminator. So the main objective of the discriminator is to learn to distinguish between what real images are, what fake images are, so that it can give some feedback back into the generator. Um, so, so basically you have an input going into the generator, the generator generates an image, the discriminator looks at the training samples from the real data distribution, and it looks at the fake samples separately, it learns and that what the discriminator uh, basically the feedback of the discriminator is used in the back propagation for the generator loss and we will look into how uh, we will look into the details of this um, the next thing is basically uh, the the loss GAN loss function so um, the main objective of the discriminator is to determine whether the given image is real so it will output a score between 0 to 1 one being the image is real, and something closer to zero means that the image is more or less fake. And uh, the main objective of the generator is to try to fool the discriminator, to make the discriminator feel or recognize that its own generated images as real. So that's what this loss function is doing. Just ignore the min part. Just look, just look at it as a max function first, because this is what the generator, the, the discriminator is doing. So the first portion here basically talks about um, the generator's objective to maximize that a given real image, the probability of a real image is real. And the second portion talks about the generator's uh, output of a fake image being fake. Okay, and um, so, so here, if you see, we're trying to flip the labels. So the output of G of Z, Z is the noise vector here, so G of Z is basically the output image of the generator, and D of G of Z is what the discriminator thinks of the output image, right? And we want, the, we want in, the, in the objective function of the discriminator, we want this difference to be max. We want the discriminator th to think that this image is fake. But when we look at the objective of the generator function, we want this difference, we want D of G of Z to be as close as, as to one as possible. So the objective of Can you zoom in on the screen a little bit? Sorry. Oh, okay. okay. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Okay. So I was talking about uh, the minimization function of the generator, right? So the objective of the generator is to basically make sure that the output of the discriminator for its uh, generated image is as close to one as possible. So its objective is to basically minimize this function. So overall, this is more or less like a minimax game, where the generator is constantly trying to create images to fool the discriminator, and the discriminator is trying to classify between what's real and what's fake. So when does a GAN actually converge, right? So this is like the big question. 
So because these two are constantly at it, and they're trying to make their uh, objective function uh, maximize or minimize their objective function. So a GAN is supposed to converge at a Nash equi equilibrium. Now what does this mean? So this means that um, the, ob the actions of one do not change as much depending on the actions of the other. So in the ideal case, you can say that a GAN is converging when the discriminator has a very small error in determining whether something is real or fake, and the generator also has a very small error in making sure that the images that is it is generated is as real as possible. Okay, and we will talk more in at the end of like towards the end of this recitation as to how we can actually evaluate these metrics. Okay, so now we have defined our loss function for a GAN. What's our main focus in a uh, generative net network? We want to be able to generate data from some sort of noise. And the most Im important like uh, operation that the generator does is the transpose convolution. It is also called as deconvolution, fractionally strided convolution. So if you're trying to look up references on how the, what the math behind this is, you will find all these terms. Um, so basically speaking, I'm not going to get into the math of it. So we all know what a convolution operation is, right? So here we have a four cross four image, and we have a kernel of size three cross three, and basically we have a, a stride of one, and we're trying to, and what we see here in green is the output image. Now, in a generator, we do something called as transpose convolution, which is essentially upsampling. So in a convolution, the main objective for us is to downsample an image, whereas in a transpose convolution, we are looking to upsample. So here's what a transpose convolution works like. So this is what is, is this is the noise vector that we have, and we have a kernel of size three cross three, and a stride of one. So at the end of the transpose convolution, you'll get a four cross four image, which is nothing but your original image. Okay. So um, it's important to know this because you will be using your generator network. Pretty much has like a bunch of transpose convolutions. Okay. So now I'm going to move into um, just looking into how the architecture of a generator and a discriminator network networks are. So, so we have provided you with like um, a PyTorch implementation of uh, the deep convolution GAN. So before that, so initially the first thing that came up was the vanilla GAN. So the vanilla GAN is nothing but a bunch of MLPs in both the generator and discriminator architectures. And then the next thing that came up with was the deep convolutional neural network. So there we had a bunch of convolution layers. And the deep convolution network had produced much better images compared to a vanilla GAN, simply because we know that a CNN learns better features when it comes to images. So the images, there was faster convergence and the quality of the generated images were also very, very good. So I'm going to directly jump into a DC GAN. So if any of you are working on projects and you're trying to start training GANs, so I would recommend starting with the DC GAN itself. Okay, so um, just a bunch of um, headers that we normally import. And let me just jump into the discriminator network first. So here's a discriminator network. So like I said, that a discriminator network is like a straightforward classifier. Okay, we've already built these in, as part of our homeworks. So we have a bunch of uh, convolution 2Ds. Um, the image, so this is on MNIST, and the image size of the MNIST is uh, uh, 28 cross 28. So when you're trying to train a GAN, you can retain the image to be 28 cross 28, or you can do things like you can resize it to 32 cross 32, and then try to train a GAN, depending on how your architecture is. So in this case, uh, we have uh, a bunch of convolution layers with batch norms. We're doing some weight initialization. Uh, we have a bunch of uh, leaky relus. And um, so uh, well, according to the base paper, it's, it's a, using a sigmoid activation for a discriminator has given good results. Okay, so this is what was rec was initially implemented. Implemented, but today there are a lot of different architectures that you can try, and there are a lot of different ways in which you can modify your discriminator and generator networks. But this is a very vanilla model for a DC GAN. Um, so this is how our discriminator ar architecture looks like. It's a simple classifier which classifies between uh, uh, whether a given image is real or fake, and then this is our generator ar architecture. So now. What's the input to our generator? It's basically a noise vector, right? So we take the noise vector, we pass it through a bunch of convolution transpose layers, and um, at the end of it, we are basically doing a tan-hatch activation 
for the generator network. And as usual, there is like a bunch of weight initializations and all of that. An interesting thing to notice is that the generator and the discriminator networks are kind of like encoder decoder architectures. You, you'll see them to be like in some sense mirror images of each other. So what you have like a bunch of layers for your uh, discriminator, you will have like the similar set of things for the generator, but they will be like convolution transpose and they will be in the opposite direction. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit. So we we are done. So. Here's some initialization. These are some helper functions to basically uh, you know, uh, plot the image, the loss graphs, and some histograms, and all of that. Um, so, these, so one thing to know is GANs are extremely sensitive to hyperparameters. Okay? So what in this code are basically uh, some hyperparameters that tend to converge. So, um, and this is by trial and error. There are no fixed set of hyperparameters that I can guarantee that will converge. So, um, and the emit size, yeah. So the emit size here is set to 64. The initial emit size of MNIST is, I think, 28 cross 28. So we have resized it in this case. Um, okay, I think, so here we're using the binary cross entropy loss because we just have like two things, whether it is real or fake. And um, we have two uh, optimizers. So now the optimizer choices for the GANs can also be different. And if you change your optimizer, your GAN might behave differently. And it might be good for your case. So for example, sometimes it's recommended that you use an SGD for the generator and an ADAM for discriminator. You could do both. So in this case, we've used ADAM. Um, yes? Can I ask about the beta 1 chips? Uh, I know uh, you changed the beta 1 to 0.5. Right. Um, so it's so the thing about GANs is just like a bunch of trial and error, right? So, and sometimes like this particular set of parameters converge on MNIST, but they might just not converge on an, like another data set like CIFAR. Yeah, so, also read about it 0.5 somewhere else. Right. So it's it's more like it's more like people have experience training GANs, and I'm going to share a link where people normally put in their experience in terms of like. Um, what parameters work, what are the diff different things that you can try. But with GANs, uh, so far, it's just been a bunch of trial and error. So, okay, so I think this is the important part where we actually see how the GAN is being trained, right? So, um, okay, so we're zeroing the gradients of the discriminator, and then we're basically creating our real and fake labels. So a real label, so basically the discriminator generates a probability close to one if the image is real. So our Y real, that is the ground truth for the discriminator when we pass a real image to it, is basically um, a vector of ones, okay? And for a fake image, the discriminator will try to produce a probability that is close to zero. So the ground truth for a fake image is a vector of zeros. Any questions about this part? Okay, all right. So. Um, so now what we do is basically we x underscore here is the real image from the real uh, distribution, and we are passing this to our discriminator network. And we get an output. And we compute the real loss, which is basically the binary cross entropy between the real image and the y real labels. Okay? And then, so now we have like a, we have trained our discriminator to some extent with the real image. So now here what you see is basically us generating the noise vector. And the latent dimension for the no, uh, noise vector, this is again best practice, is 100. So, um, and now we are passing that noise vector through our generator network. And the generator network outputs its uh, generated image. And now we're going to pass that generated image into the discriminator network once again. So initially, we have trained the discriminator network by passing the real image. Now we are passing the fake image into the discriminator network to compute our defake loss, which is the binary cross entropy between the result of the discriminator network for the fake image and the fake loss. Now, the next thing is, so the total trained loss, so this is the supervised loss, the total trained loss for the discriminator network will be the sum of your real loss and your fake loss. And that is the loss that you're going to do a dot backward of. Okay, and the, uh, the step, the update, update step for your discriminator. Now, for your generator, like if you remember, I mentioned that your generator bas basically uses the feedback from the discriminator to do its back propagation. Right, so what we're going to do is like for the generator, we are again, go we are again going to generate like a noise vector. 
we're going to create a fake image, which is going to be the output of the generator. We are now going to pass it through the discriminator, compute the generative, uh, gen generator train loss, which is basically now the loss between a trained discriminator and like what a real image should be. Okay, and then that's going to be a generative train loss, and we're going to do a dot backward of that. So I just want to make sure that this is clear. So initially, yeah, question. So that's a fake image, though. No, this is the real image. So you now you want to see. So what is it that the generator has to learn? So the generator has to learn how the image that it's generating, how real it is. So the real and the fake losses that we we used earlier was basically to train the discriminator. Oh, so it's the next part that the end has to reverse. Yeah. So you, you pass a real image to your discriminator, you learn it. You pass a fake image to your discriminator, you learn it. Do a backward on your discriminator so it learns what real and fake are, and then create a, like a, a generated image. Pass it through the discriminator, take that, and compute a loss with respect to what the real label should be. That's going to be the feedback or a back propagation for your generator function, generator loss. OK? OK, any questions? OK, cool. Um, so that's essentially how a GAN trains, okay? Now, there are a lot of variations you can do. So in this case, I'm just doing something very simple as doing an update step on the discriminator and then doing an update step on the generator. Now, there are a lot of things you can do. You could, you could train your generator five times and do one update step on your, dis on your, on, on your discriminator, or you could train your discriminator five times, like do five updates, and then do one update on your generator. Okay, so we will talk more on like when you should be doing this, like intuitively. Um, so, but this is like the general idea of how a GAN trains. Um, okay, so we have another uh, framework that we that you will find as part of this repository, and that's basically um, the same MNIST GAN, but it's been trained using Inferno. So it has like some uh, the entire code has like a lot of helper functions to basically help you with. Um, uh, creating some visualizations using TensorBoard and all of that. So I'll just quickly run through that code and then we will um, move on. What is Inferno? Inferno is just like another uh, PyTorch TensorFlow, but like a much more abstracted kind of framework. So you hardly have to do much. It's not as detailed as PyTorch. So it's basically like a bunch of things where you can like you can create trainers and you, you can like set all your optimizers and all these parameters and then to like just run. And built on PyTorch? It's built on TensorFlow actually. Yeah. But you can use it for PyTorch and it just means that you specify everything in like one like you initialize your inferno variables and specifies what loss function, how many epochs, what type of optimizers. You just specify everything and you do opt like that variable dot fit and it will start training. You don't have to specify that like uh, you don't have to calculate the loss or um, specify the optimizer.step function and it will do like proper visualization like it will show you how much time is left and it's just kind of like helper package. It's like very helpful but if you're like doing like like really stuff like in using like the things that we do implementations we do in PyTorch and TensorFlow it's very abstracted that's what I'm trying to say. What would be the difference between that and like Keras? Keras is kind of providing those high levels. Yeah, it's, 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 it's very kind of similar. Like, but if you want to use it for PyTorch. Yeah. So um so okay, so I'm just going to quickly run through this. So this is the Inferno uh, framework. So basically, we have like um, uh, this is our data loader. So we're using the MNIST data set, which is from uh, Torch, PyTorch. Uh, we have like an initializer. Um, we're formatting the images. This is again f to basically visualize um, uh, when we generate and we try to save those images. Um, so this is actually pretty cool and especially useful when you're training a GAN. So you actually want to see how your GAN is learning over like certain number of epochs. So you can actually visualize. So you can create like a visualization video using FFmpG. So it takes all your images and then it creates like a whole bunch of visualizations. So now one thing that I want to add here, and maybe um, yeah, maybe I, I will talk about it when I show you guys a visualization. So um, so yeah, so this is where you generate the video. These are basically a bunch of helper functions. There is a function which helps you reshape. And this is essentially the same, gen a very similar architecture of the generator network that I was talking about, the discriminator network. Um, let me just move on to the inferno part. Uh, so yeah, so this is what Dhruv was mentioning, right? So it, it, it just provides you like a way to, 
uh, basically uh, define your op your optimizer, your criterion, and uh, all of this. Um, so I just I just want to show you guys like this implementation. Um, so so this is a, a GAN that has been trained on MNIST. Uh, this is a regular DC GAN. And uh, so this is on the right side is what you see the real images, which are from the data. And uh, what you see on the left is basically the uh, images generated by the GAN. Um, so uh, ideally, when you're like visualizing, you should be able to see something similar. Um, so I just also, we, I think we do have a, OK, yeah, so we have it here. So this is actually a GAN that was trained by Ben from last semester. And this is something that you should all be getting as well. So um, I'm just going to show you the visualization that I was talking about. Uh, do we have audio? Oh, I think it's fine. It's fine. It's just some random music. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so I mean, just just look how cool, how cool like you start with like something like noise, and then you can see the uh, the digits actually being generated uh, based on the feedback from the discriminator, which is pretty cool. Um, so one thing that if you guys want to like create these kind of visualizations, which I think you should, um, you need to make sure like remember I mentioned that you create like a noise vector at each epoch, like for the generator, you might want to fix that noise vector. Because each time if you're generating a different noise vector, you won't be able to see the visualizations of like the same digit over time. You will be seeing like random, because in every epoch and every batch, different things are generated. So you might want to have like a separate noise vector, which is called like the fixed noise or something. And then use that, pass that to your generator network, and like try to do the visualizations for that, uh, for those images. So you can actually see it like where so yeah, uh, so this was the this was an example of a successful GAN, and like I said, um, the hyperparameters are more often than not through trial and error. Um, and so in this case, uh, the generator is trained one time every five times the discriminator was trained. So um, so this is basically like to make the discriminator really good, and then then use that, and then make one update on the generator so that the generated image is actually pretty good. Like The frequency of that is much higher. So this is an example of a failed GAN, which uh, if you guys have started working on GANs, you should be, hopefully, or unless you know, you've got the hyperparameters right, you'll probably be seeing. So when you have, so this was a case where uh, the generator frequency was 1, and uh, so the generator was being trained once. The there was like alternate gradient descent happening between the two, and it didn't work very well. So this would look something like this, just a bunch of noise, not, not really learning anything over time. Yeah, so this is not, this is not going to work. Right, so, um, so yeah, so now coming to the most imp important part. Um, GANs are definitely uh, very hard to train. Um, so if you ask me, like, how do I figure out uh, whether my GAN is doing good or not, like, I think one of the best ways to figure out is to actually look at the generated samples. The generator and the discriminator losses that you are printing may not be directly reflective of how well your GAN is doing. So the most simplest way of checking whether it's doing well is to basically kind of generate the images after, like, say, uh, a number of epochs. And the thing to do, and with GANs, you're not going to get any results in like 10 epochs, 20 epochs. It should be about hundreds and 200s. And uh, so but I think around 100 epochs, you should be able to get like decently good images. Um, so yeah, just keep that in mind. Because I had someone saying that, oh, I've trained it for 100 epochs and nothing's working. So I'm like, no, that's a very average number for GANs. Um, so yeah, so why are GANs hard to train? Like I said, so these guys, we, it's like a two-player game. They're constantly trying to you know, uh, win against each other. So more often than not, you'll, you'll see that there is a very strong uh, imbalance, that should be imbalance, between the generator and the discriminator, right? So sometimes you will see that the generator losses are going down. It's getting completely overtrained. So what happens when the generator is being overtrained? So its loss is very less, right? Which means its step updates are very, very minimal. But what does that mean? That means that the feedback that's going into the generator is actually a case of a vanishing gradient. 
right? So here you're making such small updates. So the uh, update that's happening for the generator, the gradient propagation that is happening is very small. So it's a case of a vanishing gradient problem. So your generator will not learn anything, right? So, um, so that's one major problem that you will see with GANs. Sometimes you, you, you will be like, oh, my generator's discriminator is doing so great. But when you look at the images, it's really bad. Um, and the second most common problem uh, is the mode collapse problem. So you will be like, yay, my discriminator losses are going down. My generator losses are also good. The images generated are great. But oh, when you look at the images, you're seeing that this is the first case is where we have twos being generated. So this is like basically a grid of like five cross five uh, in a given epoch, and you're seeing that all of them are twos. And in this case, you have like a bunch of mostly like ones, fours, twos, and this I think looks like an eight or whatever. So the point is like even though you're generating images, you need to make sure that they are as diverse as possible. So MNIST, for example, has 10 classes. So you want to have like uh, the generated images to be part of you, you, like part of more than like just one or two classes because if you are then it's a mode collapse problem. So let's like let's try to think like what's really happening here. So this guy, the discriminator, his main objective is to disc discriminate between something that's real and fake. Okay. So when training, the generator figures out that let's say in the first case, the discriminator every time is predicting whenever I generate a two, it's predicting that this is a real image. So great. So I'm going to keep generating twos or like twos, ones, and fours, or whatever. So I'm going to keep generating ones and fours, right? But it's wrong. That's not what your generator should be doing. It should be able to generate every, every probable every image from your true distribution of, of different classes. So this is a mode collapse problem, and you wouldn't want to have this, right? And another thing to note, a uh, question? Right. Yeah. So like, I understand why we wouldn't want to have it. What, is there, it feels like there would be a way to like, Yes, there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, I mean, so I'm, I'm going to get to that. I'm just saying that this is like one of the problems that you will encounter with, with like a basic GAN, right? And one more thing that to avoid mode collapse is that even in your data set, right? Like with MNIST, it's a balanced data set. But if you're working on like slightly complex data sets, make, so, make sure that your data set is well balanced. Because if it is imbalanced, it has like a more, more number of images belonging to a particular class, then you're kind of helping your GAN to get into a mode collapse problem. You want to make sure that your data set is balanced as well. Um, so the next problem is like the diminished gradient. This is where this actually happens more often than not, where your discriminator ends up dominating, and the generator gradients just start to vanish, like I mentioned earlier. right? If the updates are very less, it's almost like saying for the generator, it's, it's having a vanishing gradient problem. And the last thing to remember, and this is the most important thing, that GANs are extremely, extremely sensitive to hyperparameter changes. So do not, like, at least try not to, like, if something didn't work, don't try to change, like, A, B, C, D, and try. Uh, just instead change A first, and then B, and then C, and then see how your network's performing, and then only change um, the other hyperparameters for GANs. OK. So now I'm just going to, like, cover some of the um, some of the techniques that would help improve GAN performance. Um, there is a paper on this which is which covers this in detail. I would recommend you would you go through it. Uh, it's called Improvised Techniques for Training GANs. So, um, so the first thing is about feature matching. So, what really happens here? Your what is the sole objective of your generator? Your generator is trying to make sure that it produces images that are as real as possible, right? So um, here in feature matching, we, we are trying to give like an additional uh, term to the generator, which basically helps it to uh, learn the features of the real images. OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to compute the L2 distance between the means of the feature vectors. So implementation-wise, what this means is you're going to pass your real image through the discriminator just before your linear layer, get the intermediate representation out, just before you flatten it. Okay, And similarly, do the same thing for when you pass a fake image. Take the mean of those two, compute the L2 norm between them, and you want to add that to your generator loss. 
okay so feature matching does help so instead of like so yeah so this this is a very valid statement so feature matching expands the goal from just having to beat the opponent to actually trying to match the features so it avoids mode collapse so this is one of the ways in which you're going to avoid mode collapse right so it's not going to just try to start generating the tools because the discriminator is going to describe it as real because now you have like a component an additional component which actually tries to make it learn the actual features between real and fake so this is one of the ways in which you can overcome mode collapse um, the other one is the mini batch discriminations this is another uh, technique that you can use to overcome mode collapse so what happens is that what happens in a mode collapse so in a given batch uh, we have like a whole bunch of images that look similar which is what we don't want so to mitigate this, what we're going to do is we're going to take the real and the generated images into the discriminator and put them in different batches and compute the similarity index of the images generated in that batch to that image. And we want to use this score as like a penalty so that we don't have like a mode collapse problem. So it, it knows that, okay, if, if, if the similarity score is high, that means we are seeing some sort of mode collapse happening. We don't want it to be that high. Right? So you can actually use that as like a penalizing term. And the third one is like the one-sided label smoothing. So this is uh, not just restricted to GANs, but even otherwise. Um, so a lot of uh, these deep neural networks um, succumb to overconfidence. So what this means that it, it ends up, it learns like two, three features and it starts classifying everything based on those two, three features. And we don't want that to happen. We want our discriminator to be able to generalize as much as possible to have learn as many features as possible. So um, to mitigate this, uh, we normally use like regularization dropout, but we can also make sure that our, um, so when a discriminator predicts some, something that is close to one, it means that the image is real, right? So we're going to clip that to 0.9, okay? So that it ends, it tries harder to kind of learn more features to try to go over uh, like a 0.9. So I hope you're trying to get the idea. Like if we're going to try to make it like try to learn more features. So for example, if, so now what you're going to do is like, let's say uh, your one hot representation for three would be something like this, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, yeah, whatever. So now you're just gonna have a one, one hot representation that would look like this, like a point 0.9. So this is the change like implementation wise that you will have to make. So now all your one hot vectors, instead of having a label one, they're going to have a label of point, point 0.9, okay? Um, so, and the last thing is about changing the cost functions. So this is something that you should probably not do in the very first step if your GAN is not working. It's something that you should try to do like uh, much later after trying to tune with different hyperparameters. So there are a whole bunch of GANs that are there today that have different cost functions. There is W GAN, there is least squares GAN, B GAN, DREGAN, all of this. So, um, of all this, like W GAN with gradient penalty, we will talk more in the next section, uh, is slightly more stable, especially if you're having like some very complex networks. Um, it tries to uh, generate good images even if the discriminator might not be doing very well. So it tries to kind of have like some sort of stability in your model when you're trying to experiment. Um, so, and here's a link that I've just provided. It's called GAN Hacks. Uh, so it's basically a repository that's maintained by the original authors of the GAN paper. And there are like some basic hacks, uh, like what you should be doing, what kind of loss functions based on like trial and error. So I would really recommend you going through it. Um, another thing to know is sometimes that if your discriminator is overtraining, uh, or your generator is overtraining, one thing you can do is to like just add some noise to the input image to your discriminator and generator, and sometimes that helps as well. So these are the things that you can probably uh, figure out like as you train. Um, so the next section is about Wasserstein GANs, so I'll hand it over to Dhruv. Yes? Can you just explain intuitively why you do multiple rounds of training discriminators or vice versa? Sure. So, um, so the, the time when you have like, you want to do a multiple round of training the generator versus like one round of training the discriminator, right? So what's happening, you're training your GAN, your discriminator losses are going down like really well. 
okay, but your generated images are bad. So what we want to do is we want to basically train the generator like a couple of times, make one update step, right, and then because we want to send the discriminative feedback to it and give it some time to basically generate before making an update step. And the same holds like in the reverse way. So when you're, uh, let's say, when you're, you want, to, you want to make the discriminator learn a couple of times before you actually generate an image. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's, that's kind of the intuition why you would want to change the frequency of your generator and your discriminator. Yeah. And they make sure it changes my GAN so that it's proportional. Like on the fly? Well, you can do it on the fly. I mean, we're talking about a fix where we're like, train five times, update once. Train yeah. Five times. It feels like if you're saying we're trying to maintain this balance between the performance of both, it feels like you'd be able to watch their performance and like say, okay, now we're going to train the discriminator because the generator's gotten down to a certain point or has gained. So, so are you. Increase the loss to a certain point. So, are you suggesting to do it on the fly or because. Like what's there right now is like you observe you observe the losses of the two and you see how they're doing. And then you basically have your entire code which takes like generator frequency or discriminator frequency as a parameter. So basically you're like, okay, so this is what's happening to my GAN and then now, now I'm gonna run with like training the generator, let's say five times. And then then see how it works. So I mean I'm not sure if I got your question right, but I'm, I'm talking about making it is dynamic. It, 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 you should be making it dynamic, in fact. But it's you should be. Dynamic, it's, it's just a simple loop, right? It's just a simple loop. So you want to have, like, let's say, in fact, it's there in the MNIST code. So let me see if I can pull that up for you. Uh, so if you see here, so this is an example, right? So you're taking. Uh, the generator frequency as a parameter, and then you just have like a simple count variable, and you're calling train generator uh, based on this condition, which is basically saying keep training the generator until you want to. Uh, okay, but it, I mean, if this is if the discriminator isn't keeping up, it's still going to do this at the same frequency, correct? No. So here, what's so the discriminator is still training once here. So so remember what I'm saying here. I mean the updates. The update step when you're going to yeah. I think what Andrew means is, is there a way for the program to have some criteria to say the program knows that the discriminator knows as well, so it will automatically change. Oh, you want to have like a yeah. threshold or like something? An active kind of. Oh yeah, uh, you can definitely do it. It's, just, it's an implementation thing. Okay. I mean, definitely. Yeah, you should try that. Is that is that a, I, my main question was has, is that part of the other implementations of GAN that you were mentioning? Like has someone already done this or is this something? It's more like an implementation technique. Um, I mean, I'm not sure if like people have done it like an at, at an adaptive level. It's more most like you're training it, not working, so you train again with like this frequency. But it, feel free to try. I mean, yeah. I'm not aware of any implementation that does it adaptively. So, yeah. Dhruv, I have the mic. Okay, so we talked. Uh, we have talked about uh, some problems that GANs face while training, and some ways to improve GAN performance. Um, as Anushree mentioned, uh, we have this. Uh, there is a problem called mode collapse, which is like very common while training GANs. And what mode collapse is, I'll just like revise. Like when when the uh, when the generator just learns a few points that it can fool the discriminator easily, like maybe by gen like for MNIST dataset, maybe just generating twos and fours. If it keeps on generating that, the discriminator will be easily fooled because it will classify it as a real digit, 
and it's easy to learn and then it will just keep on generating that and it, it will not it will just like drop there and not come out a, 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 like ever so um, the thing with mode collapse is once once the generator enters that state it is not possible for it to come out because it what because it is generating correct images and once it has once you are in the mode collapse state you have to stop training and start again so it is very important that when you're training your GAN, see to it that you are visualizing your results. And as soon as you know that you have entered mode collapse, then all you, ha you have no other option but to stop training and restart it again with, I don't know, changing hyperparameters or changing the loss function or changing the architecture. So um, th this paper came out, Wasserstein GAN with gradient penalty, which uh, which like decreases the chances of mode collapse like by a high amount high uh, high amount and it it provides you with stable training right so i will uh, run through the code of so i won't be going into the detail of like theoretical details but i will explain what wasserstein gan with uh, gradient penalty or wgan gp is so first the wasserstein distance what, so what is Wasserstein distance? So if you have two distributions, we have one real distribution and one is generated distribution. Wasserstein distance is like the distance between those two distribution. So once we know that distance, we can optimize on it and like try to make, make the uh, generated distribution as close as possible to the real distribution. And in that sense, we can generate uh, images that look real. Right and gradient penalty is uh, as you saw in the previous loss function. You are calculating uh, the first. We are generating the image and then we are passing it through discriminator. So if uh, so, the gradient vanishing problem is like very common, right? Because like the gra because you have like uh, one gradient going through the other, like from the generator to discriminator. So we, if we have some way that like we can ensure that the gradients do not vanish, then uh, then that will like. Uh, solve this gradient vanishing problem uh, in in the original uh, so uh, another paper, wgan came out uh, before wgan gp and they suggested using weight clipping but it does not work so well so here we'll show how the gra uh, so instead um, wgan gp uses grade gradient penalty that's gp and we'll be using that and i'll run through it okay so as it obviously the program will start at main function it's uh, so if we see here the main function can see it clearly, right? Yeah. Okay. So we have just uh, a few hyperparameters that we'll be taking um, as input. Um, I think everything is quite simple to understand what we have. Uh, we have the batch size, epoxy image, image frequency, like frequency to that is like just for the program. We have latent dimension, that's the uh, dimension of the noise vector. We have discriminator and generator's learning rate. We have a pe penalty weight that like, if we, while we have calculated the gradient penalty, like how much do we need to weight it? Uh, do we need to weight it? We have the discriminator batch norm and the generator batch norm. Okay, and in the last line, as you can see, we are calling the function run. So let's go to the run function. Here we have, okay. So first what we'll do is we'll uh, load the, uh, we'll, we'll create an MNIST data loader, simple, just get the images and data loader will return the images and its labels. Uh, and then we'll create this model, which is a GAN model, a simple GAN model. Uh, uh, it's the, the, the DC GAN model that we just saw in, uh, that Anushree showed us. And uh, here, uh, now, we'll, now this is the inferno part, trainer equals to trainer. I'll show you how it was imported. Um, from inferno.trainers.basic import trainer. Okay, so we are using inferno here. Okay, and we'll just specify the loss function optimizer, like how many, after how many epochs do should we save, where should we save, how many max number of epochs. Okay, so uh, first see the build criterion function, which is wgan discriminator loss, penalty weight equals to args.penalty weight and model equals to model. So this is uh, the loss function and uh, I will, uh, so that is what is different in the wgan GP, that is the loss function, which is used in many, I, I think in almost all the new GANs that came out, this wgan GP. Okay, so let's see the loss function okay um, the forward of the loss function it takes the input and the input will be the real images and the fake images and we want to convert we want to calculate some kind of loss function based on 
the real and loss. So if, if, if the fake images are like way different than the real images, then we want the loss to be high. And if they are not, then we want the loss function to be small. So the WGAN loss that we have, it's just the mean of the uh, Y fake, that's the fake images and the real images. So if it's close, then obviously the loss will be less. And if they are, if it's not, then the loss will be high. So if you can see the last line, it's WGAN loss plus gradient penalty. So the, this, the whole block is for calculating the gradient penalty. Okay, so um, let's, uh, so, alpha, let, so first we have alpha. So what alpha does is it will come up with numbers between like zero and one. And uh, for uh, how, however image, how many images that we have, like if we have 100 images, then for each of those images, it will come up with a number between zero and one. And we'll create this X mix where uh, like with some, with like some alpha between zero and one, it will be multiplied with X real. And with one minus alpha, it will be multiplied with X fake and we'll create a combination. We'll, we are doing some kind of linear combination of those real and fake images and creating a mix of those images. And then that mix of the images, we are passing it through the uh, discriminator. So why we are doing this is because um, we want to, uh, so we have some distribution like this is let's say uh, real images and this is fake images. By doing linear combination, we find some point in between and we try to like make the fake images come to that point and like just ha just minimize that distance, right? So it passes through the discriminator. We get the probability of whether like it's uh, real or fake and we create, we calculate this Y sum. Then we, uh, we calculate the gradient of this Y sum with respect to each of this X mix. So here what grad is torch dot autograd dot grad. So we are just calculating the gradient from torch dot autograd dot grad. So A, we are importing grad. And here we are just calculating the gradient of Y sum with respect to each of this, uh, each of the X mix. So X mix is the linear combination uh, that I showed the images. Um, and then we calculate the grad norm. So uh, gradient penalty tries to keep this grad norm as close as possible to one, which ensures that the gradients are not like vanishing. So, uh, so what we do is we calculate the difference, obviously. So grad norm, we do grad norm minus one, and then we ensure that this, this distance is as, uh, we want it to be as close to zero as possible, right? Grad norm minus one. So that's why we, um, we take the square of it and take the mean. And we multiply it with, uh, with with a penalty weight, which is usually set to like a high uh, high number, like ten probably, uh, which they did in the WGA and GP paper. So this this ensures that this norm is close to one, and uh, if it is close to one, it's like low probability that it will vanish. So we all, all we do is create calculate this loss uh, as WGA loss plus self dot penalty weight multiplied by gradient penalty, or we just renamed it and we return the loss. So this, uh, we, have, we, we also have a generator loss, which is just minus y fake dot mean. Um, and uh, um, so this is, so WGAN GP has these two important things. First is the Wasserstein distance, that's y fake dot mean minus y real dot mean, and we have a gradient penalty. And uh, this ensures that the, so this, uh, if you see the results of DCGAN and WGAN GP, they are very close, but DCGAN uh, will run into mode collapse like so many times, and this provides much improved stability. So that's why WGAN GP is like quite famous and being used uh, at like almost everywhere. Okay, so let's let me show. You, let's see if I can show. You. Okay, so I can show you the results of. WGAN GP. So this may be slow, but it's like quite, um, wait. sorry, it's on, oh, this is being trained on uh, CFART and let me, wait, do we have the, okay. So we have a much better result than like the vanilla GAN model. As you can see, quite diverse and um, it's like 
now I think it's much better. And let me just skip over to the end. And I think this is doing quite well. Let me. So how many epics was that? How many epics was that? So this has been done by uh, Ben, and let me see if he provided the epoch numbers. I think it should be about like 200 odd. I mean, it's on MNIST. So it's it's MNIST. It runs very quickly. But so when we see the movements, it, that's not a fashion, that's an epic movement? Epic movement, yeah. Yeah, 100 epochs. I mean, uh, he kept this as default. Uh, I, I don't know if he changed it. But um, the latent image, uh, the noise vector was also 100 dimensional. So from 100 dimensional, it was like the uh, co uh, transpose convolution to like 28 cross 28 or whatever the image size is. So here, as see, we used 100 epochs. Um, let's see. OK. So let me, uh, so Ben also provided this video for um, WGAN GP training on CFART and data set. Let just, so it starts with noise, and then it will start learning. OK, it's not a very big video. You can kind of like very small images, uh, low resolution images. Um, you can see now we have some diversity here. But it's still not good, right? Like you, you, you can't like figure out what any of this thing is. So right? maybe for a few images you might be able to figure out, but I don't think for any of the image you can say like what this, this is. So still like th there have been like uh, more, more, more developments on this thing, like how to generate like good looking images high resolution. So let's see. So now um, we went through uh, uh, Wasserstein GAN GP, right? And now let's talk about conditional Wasserstein GAN GP. So conditional GANs have been like um, one of the best advances in GANs because you can condition how the uh, in uh, how the uh, images are being generated. So right now, in the previous models that we saw, we didn't have control over like what image will be generated. So um, let's say that you put some noise vector, and maybe you change that noise vector just by some amount, and like in maybe like one or two points, then it you you can't be sure that it will generate the same image. Like let's say it was generating zero for some noise vector, you just change like change that vector by some amount, like then it can like generate a whole new different digit. So there is no uh, you can't interpolate and like get uh, the uh, like be sure that I'll be able to generate this digit. So uh, this uh, so we uh, instead we can use uh, conditional WGAN GP or conditional GANs where you condition the image uh, that is being generated. So let me show the code for that. Okay, so how conditional uh, w, uh, conditional GANs work is um, I'll uh, just tell you. So generate. Uh, so what the generator takes as input is some noise, right? Um, when when you want to use conditional GANs, then we need to encode that condition, like what type of output do you want, and we need to encode that information and uh, concatenate it with the noise vector and pass it to the generator so that generator can learn that like, so when, uh, let's say that you want to generate, uh, like you have your MNIST data set and you want to generate, like a, you want to be able to generate like specific digit, digits, then uh, what you need to do is while passing the noise with the uh, no noise to the generator, along with that you need to pass some kind of embedding that will tell the generator that you have to uh, generate this digit. So let's see the code will go down. Okay, simple main and the same uh, hyperparameters that we have uh, here for the epochs we just have 50 and latent dimension, embedding dimensions. So here we have, uh, so latent dimension is the noise vectors dimension and we have embedding dimension which we'll use to encode the input. So like uh, for each of these 10 digits we'll have some kind of embedding and other, other things you have already seen. 
So we'll see the run function. We, we uh, take the data loader. So here the data loader is kind of different, like not much difference, but if you see, we are uh, returning x. So uh, from the data set, we get the x, that is the image, and y, that is the label. Uh, like it can be from 0 to 9, any of this thing. And we return x, comma y, comma y. Because x, comma y, uh, so 1y is for like encoding that and passing them through the embed, like creating that embedding for the generator's input, and 1 is the label. So let's see the network. Network is similar. I think now you have understood the generator and the discriminator networks, right? Um, but what you need to see is this forward function. You have some latent vector, that's the noise, and along with that you provide y. So first you pass that y through an embedding layer, which is nn dot embedding here. So 10 comma args dot embedding dimension, we have embedded it to us, uh, an embed so our embedding dimension is size 32. So we get, we get this embedding and we concatenate it with the noise and pass it through the uh, trunk, which is the generator, and we get the images. So what it means that when I pass zero, it like zero along with some noise, then it should be able, it should just like generate zeros w or whatever digit you pass, right? And uh, um, The discriminator will just try to uh, judge whether um, the image is real or not. So let me see if there's anything else here. Uh, other, otherwise, the loss functions and everything that we have used is the same thing. And let me show you some results here. So how it is different. See, like, it, it is generating all, so for all the noise vectors, when you, like, pass the same digit, then it will generate the same digit. Um, it, it will learn. So like the first is all zeros, then all ones, then all two, three, four, five. So like as you can see, here you can like not just generate random images, you can condition them to generate uh, whatever you want. Yeah. So along with the noise, Sorry, it's, this is a good thing. Okay, um, so um, what, what, like you have some noise and along with that you passed the digit, like I passed like some uh, noise comma zero. So that noise isn't guaranteed to be next to all the other zero generators, like the noise that generates zeros by itself, correct? You're just telling it, go, go generate a zero with this input, isn't that going to be hurting So um, you have the noise, and then there's a network, right? The noise passes through the network. So uh, th it it will uh, in in the uh, like individual layers of the network, it will force that like um, the transformation of that noise to be close. Like for zeros, it will be like very close. For ones, it will be like close, and they'll be farther from zeros. So it will it will just take like some. So noise is. It's not in our control because like that's just randomly generated, but the model will like for the label that it has the big uh, like okay let's say that you have two inputs the noise vectors are quite different but the embedding embedding of the digit will be like very close to each other like uh, they'll be same obviously so it, that it will learn that when when that when that is the noise uh, embedding dimension then like generate an image from that noise which is like similar so. The noise vector actually does not matter much. The embedding dimension, embedding matters, and like it will force the model to generate similar images, like based on that embedding. So if you have ten embeddings, then it will generate ten different kind of and. Okay, so we're not we're not feeding in generate a nine. We're we're saying generate. No, we, we are giving it the digit nine. Are we giving it? We're, we're giving it the digit and feeding it through an embedding, correct? Yeah. So. Yeah, you have a one hot encoding. So for like, if you want to pass uh, zero, then it will be one, and then all zeros. It will pass through an embedding layer, and you'll get some embedding. And we are not passing uh, like giving any information how the nine should look or how the zero should look. It will automatically learn that. So that is like the novelty in conditional GANs. Okay, but am, am I correct in saying that like when you feed in two random vectors, if hmm. you're close together, they should represent 
In GANs, no. Uh, yeah, if two random noise vectors are very close to each other, there is no guarantee that it will generate like si similar images. For variational autoencoder, that stands correct. But for GANs, it is like that is different. So some, so, so you might like one good idea is um, if you have some noise vector, then and uh, then you can just like kind of interpolate and like find um, like generate. Let's say that you find some noise vector which generates like a good zero. Then you can just like have like just change it a little and like generate more like better zeros, right? But that is not that that is not the case with GANs, like so. Yeah. So uh, conditional GANs. Uh, here we specified uh, digits. Um, you have all types of different conditions that you can use. Like f we have facial facial face images synthesis. And you can pa you can encode expressions, you can encode poses, and like pa uh, concatenate it with the noise and generate images with those facial expressions and poses. Like uh, people have done uh, not just expressions. You have hair color. You have with mustache, with not mustache, with specs, with not specs. You can encode everything and pa and like condition your GANs to generate images according to like your whatever you have encoded. So. Um, we'll, we'll talk about a few like la like latest trend in GANs, but first, uh, the most uh, difficult and unsolved problems in GAN is how to evaluate the GANs. Okay, so for GANs, what we have is we have some real images, we have some generated images, but and because they're images, we we don't know exactly know how to like how to evaluate that these generated images are as close possible as close as possible to these real images, right? So um, first we have like some evaluation metric that, um, that have been proposed are, the first is inception score. So what inception score it does is it just calculates the uh, KL divergence between the real images, the distribution of the real images and the distribution of the generated images. And it will judge these distributions based on the quality of the generated images and their diversity. And um, as inception is a score, we can say that high inception score is good. I'd highly suggest that you read the paper and try to understand like the uh, internal mechanics. But uh, I'm, uh, does anyone not know what KL divergence is here? It's K, so KL divergence, is, it's just like how much the uh, model distributions are different from each other. So uh, that so that is what inception score tries to do. Um, then we have uh, freshet in inception distance. So what this does is you have some inception network and you extract features from an intermediate layer. This is very important. Then you take uh, for like real real images and the generated images. You have some uh, you uh, like extract those features. Then you calculate the mean for the real images and the generated images. And you calculate the covariance of the real images, the generated images, and the covariance matrix of the uh, real and generated again. And you uh, and you calculate FID using this formula, where this uh, this is the difference between the mean, taking the norm and taking the square. And TR stands for trace. That is, uh, this will give you a matrix, a covariance matrix. And you take the uh, sum of the diagonal elements. And this is the distance between, like, how, how uh, this. This is kind of representing the distance between uh, the real images, the distribution of the real images and the generated images. So we want it to be as low as possible. Then, uh, you, uh, then there is like precision recall and F1 score, but um, it's uh, it's not as uh, highly used. Like uh, inception score is the most used thing. Okay. Um, Wasserstein distance has also been proposed to be used as an evaluation metric, but its computation time is O of n cube, which makes it very difficult. Like, yeah. Distance between KL and Wasserstein distance. We're both looking at distributions. Yeah. Um, so uh, Wasserstein distance will give you. Uh, Of the quality of the generated images. So you want this to be high. So 
So it's, it's kind of like looking at entropy. So when you, entropy is nothing but randomness, right? So you want the randomness to be more in, in, in terms of when you're talking about how your layers are, you want it to be more random. But you want the generated images to be as predictable as possible. So you want them to be less random, right? So you can think of like the KL distance here between the two as some kind of like uh, entropy distance between both of them. So you want them to be orthogonal. So that is different. And Wasserstein is different. That is where you're trying to find the distance between the real distribution and the fake distribution. So Wasserstein distance computes that. Here we're trying to compute generated the quality versus the diversity in like the labels. Okay, so um, this uh, evaluating GANs is still like an unsolved problem and we don't have a good way to like evaluate. Um, many papers, they just, what they do is, um, e they'll either like uh, hand pick or cherry pick good examples that uh, the GAN generated and put them in the papers. Some will actually like select randomly and put them and um, like it, it is for us to decide how the how good the evan is uh, how good the gan is so it's more like um, qualitative evaluation um, for quantitative evaluation we, we are still like we have uh, miles to go um, so uh, let, let's talk about latest work in gans so i'll show let's see if they can so as you can see this images are being generated uh, like are being gen uh, have been generated by GANs. Uh, so the, I'll tell you about this GAN model. It's called progressive growing of GANs, mm -hmm. and this this uh, GAN uh, has been like this model has been trained on celebrity high quality data set. So celeb A data set, which is like a high resolution images of many celebrities. There are like I think millions of images, and uh, um, this is the condition. Like you can specify uh, like everything. Like there's these are like plus and minus. So you can like for blonde hair, you can like uh, click on plus many times and increase that. Uh, I, I don't know the intensity of blondness in the hair and like black hair. And you can you you are able like it is generating really good results as you can see. None of those images are real, by the way. So yeah, none of those images are real. You're you're conditioning and you're generating. You can change gender, age, skin tone like hairstyle, anything, like you can put accessories and stuff, right? So I'll tell you how, so this um, progressive growing of GANs, like this is the first model that generated like, f like really photorealistic images, as you can see, like you have it right in front of you, right? So what they do, I'll explain like in um, very brief, um, th they, uh, what they do is they s s start by learning like four cross four images, like very small, low resolution images. Once it has learned that, that is like when the, now the discriminator cannot like decide whether like all the images, they're either real or fake. It's like totally confused. It will move on to generating eight cross eight. Once it has learned that, it will go to 16 cross 16. Like that, for this model, it, they have gone till 1024 cross 1024. Right and uh, progressive growing of GANs, it didn't have the conditions. So this is kind of an uh, an upgrade on this, like where you can condition the progress the GAN to generate uh, wh however type of images you want, right? So okay. Um, so in the summer, I also worked on progressive growing of GANs, and let me show you a video. So. It's, as you can see, it's this. So I've taken, I've randomly picked six noise vectors. And for each epoch, I'll show you like how the GAN is learning to train. And uh, so I, uh, be, I wanted to try out whether like uh, this can, progressive growing of GANs can work across uh, data sets. So what, we are, what the task here, it is to generate per, like images of perfume bottles. So as you can see, it will first learn four cross four images, then eight cross eight. So first it will be like very big pixels, and then like it will start getting like, uh, start becoming a better resolution image. So as you can see, like first it's just noise. Then, it's, then now this is like learning the structure of perfume bottles, like what like the abstract shape is, right? And like generating different, uh, like different colors. And uh, as you can see now the resolution is like increasing slowly. 
and this thing. So if you see this image, it's not learning anything. Like this does not, like others do seem like perfume bottles, but this does not. But as like it will keep on learning, it just like, it will start learning. Just give it a sec. So now the resolution is quite good, right? See now, now this is like really good. Like it's just started learning. So with GANs, it is this thing. You might just like stop. And now we have like 512 cross 512 images. Right? So um, it's not perfect like this. Like there is nothing here. It may be, maybe there can be some white thing, but, it, but it's still like, so um, this model, uh, celebrity uh, data set had like a million images. This was just trained on like 25,000 images. Yeah? yeah? I want to ask about how they do the progressive thing, because uh, back in homework to when I tried to change the structure, I kind of mm -hmm. start over again, because the structure is changed and all the weights are useless. Like, how do you... Yeah, you, uh, you, you need to have some kind of symmetric network that... Um, for uh, let's say for four cross four, you have some network, so it will be like generate the four cross four images and then discriminate the four cross four images. When you want to add eight cross eight, you need to have that same structure and then like plug in the eight cross eight thing. Mm -hmm. So the, the uh, weights are already learned for the four cross four thing, and you you do allow them to change, but not as much. Oh, so so keep yeah, you you sure. keep like plugging things. Okay. So is that even like another layer of higher resolution? Yeah, we keep on adding those layers. Okay, um, I just give you like some um, some kind of like uh, how hard it was to train. Firstly, this model because uh, because uh, progressive growing of GANs it's very difficult. It's not difficult to train, but it takes a lot of effort. Um, this model like for this training it took ten days to train on four GPUs, and uh, the data set is also not like very big. It's twenty five thousand, right? So if if I had a hundred thousand, then it would have taken even more time, right? Um, so. Although it did not run into mode collapse problem, right? Because because uh, we, we are using Wasserstein uh, GAN with GP, that loss uh, along with uh, other losses. So the new trend, one also one of the new trend in GANs is not just using one loss function, but using multiple loss function. So you have one loss function that will like give you a pixels, pixel wise loss. You have one uh, GP, uh, WGAN GP loss, you have one where you try to preserve the variation smoothness, one where you try to see that the digit, let's, let's say for this condition, like whatever condition you put, whether uh, the image generated is actually of that condition or not. So you uh, actually do a linear combination of multiple loss functions and uh, train your GAN. So that is like, um, if you want to, I don't know, do, if you're doing research on GANs and you want, you're coming up with a new architecture, then selecting a good loss function is very important. And you, you, you always go with multiple loss functions. Um, there are many papers, you can take a look at them and like design a good loss functions. Um, do you guys have any other doubts or anything on GANs? If not, then I think that's it for now. Yeah.